So, you know, when I talk about the world of the internet and how the web has changed business, you know, a lot of people, obviously the web has changed how we do business, how we conduct business. There's e-commerce, there's auctions, there's reverse auctions, there's all those sorts of things. But when I look at how the web has changed business, I look at it a little bit differently. I look at the world, I guess, I look at the world in two different date ranges, right? There's AD, there's CE, and then there's uh, what I like to call is BG. What is BG? BG is before Google. How old's Google? Google's about 15 years old. So when we think about uh, how a world has changed in the past 15 years, you know, if, if you remember like 16 years ago, when, if you were in business 16 years ago, remember you used to take out your clients for two-hour lunches and you'd go to maybe take them to a four-hour sporting event? Well, who takes clients out for two-hour lunches any, anymore? We don't have to. It, frankly, clients or prospects don't give us two hours. Because in today's world, our customers, our clients, our prospects have what we call all buyer's intelligence. And in fact, it's estimated that in a business-to-business -business type of a relationship, 93% of buyers have Googled, for lack of a better term, the sales company or you prior to any meeting. So it's not only that they've Googled your company, they feel that they have a pretty good understanding of your products, your services, your solutions, and even you. In today's world, we all have a personal brand. I give a lot of presentations. That, by the way, today I'm going to kind of be teaching you how to find information on others. I do a lot of presentations on how to make sure people are finding the right information on you from a personal perspective. Because I can guarantee you people are out there looking for you. Our buyers today have what we call buyer's intelligence. And Forgive me on this. I keep getting this pop-up window, so I'm going to change my color scheme as it suggests. So I don't know why they want me to do that, but... Let's see. Um, so buyers today have what we, let me repeat, buyers today have what we call buyer's intelligence. They're pretty smart about us. They know what we have to sell. They know our offerings. They're prepared before we as salespeople go into the meeting. So what's our excuse? What's our excuse for not having sales intelligence? And I hear the excuses all the time. Oh, you know, I'm uh, uh, I call on really small companies. There's nothing out there on those people. Or the people that buy from me are mid-level managers at huge companies. There's nothing out there on those people. Or I don't have time to do any of this stuff. Or every time I go into Google, I just get a bunch of junk. Well, we're going to blow those excuses out of the world today. Today, we're going to talk about sales intelligence, how to find information in ways you never thought possible. We're going to spend about three or four more minutes on what I call the theory of the fourth R, and then we're going to dive in. I'm giving you a taste of Fourth Hour University, how to find information in ways you never thought possible. So if you think your kids are smart on how to use Google and how to use the Internet, we're going to blow that out of the water today. And then we're going to learn not only just because, so what? So you can search Google better than anybody else. Who cares? How do we actually use these tricks and tips to find more prospects, to grow our business, and then I'm even going to put us through a case study. So we're going to pretend that we're calling on a company, a real company. I picked a real company, but I picked a small privately held company just to show you the types of information that is out there. I'm going to pause for a second here. I just want to open up my GoToWebinar again. And I just want to get this all set. There we go. By the way, this is all going to be um, recorded. So one of the reasons you're hearing me pause a little bit is in the recording, I'm going to go in and edit out all the junk here, all the, all the places where our technology is not cooperating. So how do we use the fourth R for, uh, again, finding information, finding new leads, highly qualified prospects, and connecting with those prospects in a meaningful way prior to meetings? Now, just like in Miami, uh, I'm going to say to you here that I kind of violate all known rules of presentations and all known rules of webinars. Typically, in a one-hour webinar, you should maybe have about, oh, 25 slides or so. Yeah, well, I promise you I'm going to get through my, I think I've got about 220 in this webinar, and I will get through them on time. So what I've done for you is I've actually kind of created a, a handout or, or really the notes for today's program in a sense. And you can download those notes by going to www.kmsam.com. It's just basically a, a really simple mobile-enabled uh, form where you can type in your email address. And then, it, you know, you can do it right now. And by the uh, end of this webinar, the guidebook or the notes for today's program will literally be sitting in your inbox. So feel free to take notes. Feel free to watch the recording in the future. 
but know that this handbook has really all the step-by-step -step instructions on how to implement everything I'm going to share with you today and uh, uh, even more. There's a lot more in the handbook that I'm even sharing with you today. So feel free to download the handbook and share it with your team. And again, it'll be the step-by-step -step instructions on everything we're talking about today. In addition, I uh, thought I'd give you guys an incredible offer. I've got a, a, a book. It's a best-selling book called Take the Cold Out of Cold Calling. It was named 2012 Sales Book of the Year. And then I have a corresponding video series. Uh, my video series is my really my three-hour university. It's the full university course on this. And I'm making it available to IAPD members today at a special 50% off deal. So I'll tell you more about that on the end. Uh, my point in just bringing it up is, is there's a lot to everything I'm going to share with you and through the guidebook, my book, my videos, all those sorts of things. Uh, you have plenty of access to be able to implement and practice everything I'm sharing with you today. So what is the fourth R? You know, we've all gone to school learning that if we master the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic, we can communicate effectively, we understand a budget, that we're going to be successful in business. And I would argue in today's world, where there's so much information out there and we've been given access to all these amazing tools, we have to understand or somewhat become masters of the fourth R, or research. Now, not to say that you're going to be some kind of a librarian or anything like that, but how can we use these tools that have been kind of dropped in our laps over the last 15 years? I mean, Google showed up 15 years ago. It's pretty easy. You just go in, you type in a couple of words, and you get some great stuff. LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, um, social networks, the invisible web, all these tools have kind of been given to us, but we've never really received the manual. I mean, how many of you have ever read the manual on how to effectively search Google? Well, my guess is no one, because unless you went to library school, there is no manual. These, these tools just kind of showed up, and you're supposed to know how to use them. But I think we would all agree that knowing how to use these tools is really important for our business. But no one's ever taught you how to do it. So today is really maybe the first time where you really learn how to use these tools. Now, why is this so important? In sales, in business development, and in client relationships, one of the things we oftentimes tend to forget is that our clients are amazingly passionate about one thing. Our prospects are amazingly passionate about one thing. What is it? It's themselves. People care about themselves. People are amazingly passionate about themselves. What does that mean for you? It means that when you go have a sales call, when you have a sales meeting, the other person doesn't care about you. They don't care about your products. They don't care about your solutions. They don't care about your catalog. They don't care about your PowerPoint presentation. And yet, almost all the time when we have those meetings, What's the first thing we want to talk about? Ourselves. So what I'm going to be sharing with you today is really techniques to find information on other people so the first words out of your mouth is about them. Show the other person that you care. Show the other person that you're relevant to the things that they care about. Yes, I'm going to show you how to use Google in ways you never thought possible, and that's cool. But why do we care? The reason we care is it allows us to connect in meaningful ways with our prospects and our clients. Because again, they don't care about you. They care about themselves. This gives you the ammunition to talk about something that you know that they care about. Their company, their world, their business, their competitors, their industry. That's the power of what I'm showing you today. So that's the theoretical part of today's program. Let's dive in. Let's give you a taste of no more. So again, we've only got an hour together. I, I can't give you the, the full No More program. That's really the videos and the, the, you know, the stuff that's in the guidebook and the books. But I'm going to give you a taste of my favorite techniques that I know will work for you the first time every time. So we're going to put you through 4th R University, how to find information in ways you never thought possible. And we're really going to start out in Google University. Now, we're frankly going to start out in Google Kindergarten. We're going to start out with some of the basics. So for some of you that might know the basics, don't worry. I'm going to get into the advanced stuff. I'm going to get into high school, college, even a master's degree and a little bit of PhD on how to use Google to find information. So Google Kindergarten, what is Google? You know, Google's really nothing more than a big vacuum cleaner. So imagine this big vacuum cleaner going around the Internet, and what it's looking for are websites with words on the page. When Google finds a website with words on the page, what it does is it flips on the vacuum cleaner, it sucks up those words and it stores those words in the big Google vacuum cleaner bag. So if you go into Google and type in one, two, or three words, all that Google's doing is saying, where do those three words appear most often on the internet? Here you go. And it delivers you a list of results. There's no human being on the back end telling you that these results are better than those results. It just kind of gives you a list of results. So let me give you a couple of tips 
on how to effectively use Google. One of my favorites is the minus sign. So how many of you use the minus sign when you're searching? The minus sign is super powerful. It actually acts as a filter. It allows you to remove search results. Let's use an example. Now I'm going to use my, my 16 year old daughter Madeline as our example here. Maddie was in history class and her teacher says, hey Maddie, I want you to write a report on the Vikings, the guys from Norway from like, oh, 500 years ago with the big boats and the swords and those kinds of things. So Maddie does what any 16 year old does. She's going to fire up Google. She types in the word Vikings and what does she get? She gets 17 million search results on the, well, unfortunately, probably worst team in the history of professional football. Now she doesn't want football, she wants the guys from Norway with the big boats and stuff like that. So what can she do? She can use a minus sign. She can look at the result list and say, okay, what word in there don't I want? Oh, I don't want the word football. Now here's the magic trick. You attach the minus sign to the word that you want to remove. You literally attach it. Don't put a space there. If you put a space after the minus, Google is going to think that's a dash and it'll ignore it. But if you attach the minus sign to the word, Google will remove that word from the search results. And you can do this like 30 times. So if I don't want the word Wikipedia, I go right back up and do minus Wikipedia. If I don't want the word, oh, I don't know, I don't want the word Saga or Nova, I can go right back up and do minus Saba, minus Noga, Nova. And every time I tap in a minus sign, Google will remove the results with that word in there. Now another super powerful one that will save you a lot of time if you're not doing today, and that is quotation marks. When you put something within quotation marks, you're telling the search engine that the words within quotation marks must be in that exact order every single time. So when do you use this? Anytime you're searching for a proper noun, name of a person, name of a company, or even a phrase like annual revenue, you want to put it within quotation marks. Because otherwise Google treats it with what I like to say is a plus. When Google's looking at three words, if you don't put it in quotation marks, what Google's saying is those three words must appear somewhere on the page, but in no particular order. So most of you, when you go in and type in the name of a person as an example, you probably go in and I'm looking for Karen Jane Anderson. You go in, you type in Karen Jane Anderson. What Google thinks you mean is plus. Those three words, all of those words must be on the page, but in no particular order. So you get Melissa Jane Anderson, Karen Jane Anderson, uh, you get Karen Anderson, and then, and then Jillian Anderson. So those three words are all on the page, just not in the order that we want. So do, by doing a simple thing, like putting words within quotation marks, you're telling the search engine that the words within quotation marks must be in that exact order every single time. And we go from millions of results to a couple of thousand results, again, all of them being Karen Jane Anderson. So anytime you're searching for a proper noun, name of a person, name of a company, or even a phrase like annual revenue, shipping logistics, whatever you want, you know, uh, uh, conveyor belts, trucks, whatever. Anytime you're looking for multiple words, put those words within quotation marks and you'll get way better results. So that was kind of Google kindergarten. So let's move into a little bit of junior high and high school. Okay, so we know a couple of techniques. How do we actually use those techniques to find better information. Now, effective searching online is what's called Boolean logic by a mathematician named George Boole. So you may have heard that term before. It actually goes back to the, I think, the beginning of computers, the early DOS days. Uh, those, those same techniques are used today. So let me show you what's called a complex Boolean search. So I want to find decision makers at a uh, prospect of mine. So I want to sell into Ford Motor. Who's in charge of purchasing or procurement over at Ford Motor? So this is what's called a complex Boolean query. Google, every search result you deliver must have the phrase Ford Motor in it. It must have the phrase vice president or the word director. Now another Boolean term is or in all uppercase. When you put something in all uppercase, you're telling the search engine, I want one or both of those terms. Now I put that in parens. You don't really need to but it helps me think mathematically, because Boolean logic, again, is a mathematical equation. So again, Google, every search result you deliver me must have the phrase Ford Motor, must have the phrase Vice President or the word Director, and must have the word Purchasing in it. And when I run that search, I get some pretty decent results. But eyeball it carefully. What's showing up that I maybe don't want? Remember, I'm looking for names of people. What's showing up are job opportunities. Well, I don't want that. 
So that's kind of the, the difference now between the science of searching and the art of searching. The science of searching is knowing the Boolean stuff, the or, the plus, the minus sign, the quotation marks. The art is knowing when to use it. So I kind of eyeball my search results and I say, okay, what am I not looking for? Well, I'm not looking for the word jobs. So what can I do? Well, based on what we just learned, what would you do? You're going to log right back into Google and you're going to do, you're going to add minus jobs. So Google, every search result you deliver must have the phrase Ford Motor, must have the phrase Vice President or the word Director, must have the word Purchasing. But if any of those results have the word jobs in those, I don't want to see that. By minusing out jobs, <laughs> excuse me, by minusing out jobs, now we get names, we get job titles, we get the types of information that we're interested in. So again, knowing the science of searching is important. Knowing the art of when to use it is even more important. Now, how many of you suffer from temporary amnesia? Or how many of you are like me that suffer from permanent amnesia? Or how many of you can't even remember? What do I mean by that? You know, we've all gone to conferences, industry conferences, and uh, those sorts of things. And we meet somebody, and we think to ourselves, wow, this person will be a great partner, a great prospect of mine. But, but maybe that, that person didn't have a business card. You think to yourself, oh, no big deal, I'll remember their name. You want to go back and Google them, and you can't remember their name. You're just like me. So I've got a solution for it. I call it temporary amnesia, amnesia solution. Google calls it a wild card or an asterisk. Anytime you can't remember a piece of information, just, just drop in an asterisk, and Google will fill in the blanks for you. So for example, I met this guy. He works at Anderson, Anderson something Associates. Well, I can't remember his name. Now, I know the first word is Anderson. I know the last word is Associates. So I put the whole thing in quotation marks. I just can't remember the stuff in the middle. So I drop in an asterisk, and Google will fill in the blanks for me. There's Anderson Kelly Associates, Anderson Johnson Associates, Anderson Periodontic Associates, Anderson Ritter Associates. Again, every one will have the first word be Anderson, the last word Associates. I want to treat it like a proper noun. I put the whole thing in quotes. Anytime I can't remember a piece of information, I drop in an asterisk, Google fills in the stuff in the middle. How else can I use these techniques? How about finding job titles? So vice president of something at 3M. Now notice how I put the entire search within quotation marks. Vice president of something at 3M. I just can't remember what the something is, so I drop in the asterisk. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not hacking into 3M's employee directory. Uh, I, I could show you how to do it. It's just a way more expensive webinar. <laughs> but uh, what I'm looking for are web pages where that phrase exists. Google, go find me a web page where the phrase Vice President of Something at 3M exists. Again, I'm putting the whole thing in quotes because I want to treat it like a phrase. I put it in an asterisk where I can't remember the piece of information, and Google will fill in the blanks for me. So Vice President of R&D, Vice President of Investor Relations, Vice President of International Operations, Human Resources, Talent Solutions, on and on and on. Put the whole thing in quotes, put in an asterisk or I can't remember the information, Google fills in the blanks for me. How about email addresses? How many of you would like to find email addresses? Well, think about this for a second. For most of us, our email address is the same back end as our website address. So if I work at Widget Corporation, my website address is www.widget.com, my email address is probably something like srichter at widget.com. So how do we find email addresses? Now let me give you an example. Uh, I'm going to, I want to find the email addresses for this company, parknicolet.com. They're a healthcare center based in Minnesota. So notice that I do my nice Boolean search in the Google search, parknicolet within quotes plus health, and I find out that the website address is parknicolet.com. Then I do the something at trick, and I can go in and I do something at parknicolet.com. So remember, most of our email addresses start with with the first part of the name or however they do it, the at sign, and then the website address, parknicolet.com. Magic trick, put the whole thing within quotation marks because we want to treat this like a phrase. And what are we telling Google? And we're not hacking into Park Nicolet's email directory. Instead, what we're looking for are web pages where an email address might exist. It could be a um, an industry uh, newsletter or something where somebody at Park Nicollet wrote a byline article and they put their email address. Maybe somebody at Park Nicollet serves on a nonprofit board and they post their email address. And what I'm really looking for is the naming convention. So once I have the naming convention, I can pretty much figure out anybody else's email address at the company. So if I'm looking for Phil Smith, Phil's email address is probably phil.smith 
at parknicollet.com. Let me just give you a word of caution when doing the email searching. And that is on most of the techniques I'm sharing with you, my hope is, is that the information you're looking for shows up in the first page of Google search results. Matter of fact, I can't even remember the last time I went to the second page of Google search results. When you do a nice Boolean search, what you're looking for will show up usually right up top there. Except this one. When you're searching for email addresses, oftentimes you need to go to the 5th, the 50th, the 200th. You know, just click on random pages until you start seeing email addresses show up. I'm not really sure why that is. I just know that it, that it works that way. So don't get frustrated if you're not seeing email addresses on the result list when you run this search. You may have to go to further pages uh, down the line. Now, I love this next trick. I call it Google more or less. You've all seen it. If it's on every single Google search result, but if you're like most folks, you have no clue that it's even there. So how do we use it? One of the things that I recommend is before you go meet with a company, you go pull up a news article on the uh, company or even the individual. Because again, people like to talk about themselves. So one of the things that I recommend is before you go meet with somebody, 10 minutes before the meeting, whether you're in the lobby, whether you're in your car, take out your mobile device and Google the company. So I typed in Caterpillar. I got a meeting over at Caterpillar, and I find their website, cat.com. Now, I've already looked at their website. I already know what they do. And frankly, from a sales intelligence perspective, looking at someone's website, it's like whatever. Um, it's their online brochure. Who cares? So I want to go find news articles. Now, unfortunately, I pull up 123 million results. Now, I've got 10 minutes before my meeting. I don't have time to look at 123 million results. So what can I do? Well, in the main navigation on the Google search result page, you've all seen it because it's on every single Google search result, there's a button called the More button. Like I said, it's on every single Google search result. Whether you're looking for Caterpillar or you're looking for Italian restaurants, it's there. And how many of you even have seen it before? And how many of you click on it? Well, if you're like most folks, not very many of you. I think you'll change that after today. Because what happens is when you click on the More button, you get a drop-down menu. And on that drop-down menu, it allows you to sort your search results. So of those 123 million search results, only show me patents, only show me blog posting. The one I recommend, 10 minutes before every meeting, is news. So click the More button, click the News button, and pull up recent news articles about your search. Now in this example, because Caterpillar is such a huge company, I pull up 28,000 results. Well, again, it's 10 minutes before the meeting. I don't have time to look at 28,000 results. What can I do? Well, there's a little buddy button on that search result navigation called Search Tools. How many of you click on it? Again, after today, hopefully most of you will. Because what you can do when you click on your search tools is you can actually sort your results. I can sort my news results. Only show me stuff from the past week, the past month, the past year, the past hour. And so I can go from millions of search results to thousands of search results to one. How cool is that? Now when I'm meeting with somebody at that company, I can say, hey, you know, I was doing a little research on you folks, and I came across that article. I came across that news story. And I can talk about something that I know that they care about themselves. The easiest way to get somebody talking about themselves is find something that was in the news about their company or their competitor or their industry and share with them the information that you have. Get the other person talking. Once they're talking about themselves, then you can ask those meaningful questions. You know, we've all gone to these sales training courses where you're taught to ask meaningful questions. The problem is you don't have permission to ask those questions because you haven't engaged your prospect in a meaningful way. The easiest way to engage your prospect is to find something you know is relevant to their world, whether it's about themselves, their companies, their competitors, their industry. Find something about the other person. Now, this next trick I just love. It's called file type searching. How many of you have ever downloaded a file from the internet? Well, most of you have without even really knowing it. And there's literally billions of files out there. People post billions of files online, PowerPoint documents, PDF files, Word documents. How do you find them? Use what's called a file type colon search, where I have YYY. You replace that with the kind of file you're interested in. So if I'm interested in Excel spreadsheets, I do XLS, PowerPoint documents, PPT or PPTX, Word, DOC or DOCX, PDF, PDF files. Let me show you a couple of examples. I want to go find a document on plastics and its use in the aerospace industry. So I type in aerospace plus plastic plus 2013, 
magic trick file type colon PPT. Now something you need to know, when Google goes out and looks for a file, it literally opens up the document and vacuums up every single word inside the document. So not only are the titles of these documents searchable, but every single word in that PowerPoint, in that Excel spreadsheet, in that Word document become searchable. So Google, go find me a PowerPoint document where inside the PowerPoint document is the word 2013, the word plastic, and the word aerospace. And I pull up 2,700 PowerPoint documents. Of course, I can click on any one of these, and those will open up the full PowerPoint document. What are these kinds of things? Well, they can be conference presentations, competitors' proposals, all sorts of things. This is just a fun one I like to, to show people because I love to scare people. I do some work for Jacobs Global Engineering. They're one of the largest engineering firms in the world. They build a lot of uh, nuclear facilities. So they wanted to find a, a list of attendees uh, that might go to, say, uh, conferences. And those attendees are members of the National Nuclear Security Administration. So Google, go find me an Excel spreadsheet where inside that spreadsheet is the word list or the word attendee and the phrase national nuclear security. And a bunch of results show up. And I just love it when I find these kinds of things. Uh, look at the web address of this result here. Secure.interpol. Really? It was really secure. Hmm. That's why I was able to find it in like a 30-second Google search. And when I click on the list, I get the contact information of all the people at the National Security Administration full contact information, including office line, fax line, address, and even email address. Like I said, it's kind of scary what you can find online once you know where and how to look. So those are just a few Google search tips. I, I hope you found them helpful. And uh, now one of the things you're probably all sitting there going is, okay, this is great, Richter, but I don't have time to do any of this stuff. Um, if you're like me, you just want somebody else to do all the work for you. And the good news is you can, and it's free. Go get yourself a Google Alert account. Go to google.com slash alerts. Sign up for your free account. Uh, in your free account, once you have that, watch what you can do. So first off, you want to open up a regular Google search. So in this example, I want to search on my name and my book and my presentations. So Google, anytime something shows up on my name, I want to know about it. And I kind of eyeball the results, and I go, yeah, that's the kind of stuff I want more of. So then I, comp I copy my complex Boolean query, I open up my Google Alerts account, and I paste it right in there. Now what happens in the future? Well, what happens is every time Google finds results that meet my search criteria, it sends me an email. And if it finds 50 things, it doesn't send me 50 emails. It sends me one email with the 50 new things we found today. I recommend you set up alerts on your company, of course, yourself, your kids, uh, your competitors, all of your prospects, all of your clients, and have Google send you new information. Now, you're going to know some of it, of course, a lot of it probably, but I can tell you from doing this that at least once a day I find something that I didn't know about a prospect or a client, and then I can quickly forward that person a note. Hey, Joe, congratulations on winning that award. Hey, Sally, way to go on that promotion. It allows us to stay in touch with our clients in ways that are relevant and meaningful to what they care about. You see, most of us only communicate with our prospects and clients when? When we have something to sell them. How refreshing is it when you can send your client a note, your prospect a note, when it's all about them and has nothing to do with, with you? You know, hey, Julie, way to go on being named uh, chair of that nonprofit organization. Send them a note when there's something occurs that they care about. Hey, Frank, great job landing that new account. I know it's something you've been working on for a long time. It allows us to stay in touch with people in ways that are meaningful to what they care about. So those are some Google search tricks. Again, not all of them. There's a lot more in the guidebook and way more in the video series, but I hope you found those helpful. Now we're going to dive into the next section. It's called the invisible web, or websites that for whatever reason, Google can't even vacuum up. Well, what kind of websites can't Google vacuum up? What percentage of the free and publicly accessible internet do you think Google even gets to? Well, it's not 100% because that's not one of your options. 75%, uh, 30%? Well, most people are shocked when they find out the answer. It's actually less than 5%. Google actually gets less to gets to about 4.8% of the free and publicly accessible internet. The rest is what's called the invisible web. What does that mean, the invisible web? Why are websites invisible? Well, think about it. 
Uh, there could be some technical reasons, but that's not the main portion of the invisible web. The main portion of the invisible web are websites that, for whatever reason, Google can't even get to. Uh, what kind of websites can't Google get to? Oh, um, websites where you have to register. You've all gone to websites where you have to register. It, you know what I'm talking about. You register, and then you know, registration is free, so it's the free and publicly accessible internet. And by registering, you get access to about 100,000 articles. Well, those 100,000 articles, because they're behind a username and password, are on the invisible web. They're invisible to search engines. And the owner of that website doesn't want Google to be able to find those articles, because if Google could find the articles, if you could find the articles via Google, you wouldn't have to go to the website. So that's the invisible web. So Facebook is an example. Most Facebook pages, you have to log in to register. Facebook's free, but you've got to register. LinkedIn, a semi-invisible website. Now, a lot of invisible websites, you do have to go in and uh, create a free account. And so you do have to do that. And a lot of invisible websites have a premium component where they want to upsell you uh, to pay to their paying tools. I'm just showing you the free stuff today. So for example, one of my favorite invisible websites is Jigsaw.com, uh, soon to become Data.com in 2014. Uh, it's a free site. You go get your free registration. Now Jigsaw builds its database by collecting business cards. So they literally have hundreds of millions of business cards. So you can go in and you can type in the name of a company. I typed in layered plastic. Notice how I'm using my Boolean, my quotation marks. And Jigsaw will give me some information about the company. It gives me a broad range on the number of employees, a broad range on the revenue number. So somewhat helpful, not super helpful, but somewhat helpful. But because they built their database collecting business cards, I can go see all of the key executives at the company. Now, how does Jigsaw make its money? Well, if you click on any of the blue names, they'll sell you the contact information, the email address. Well, we don't need to buy it because we already know how to find the email address, don't we? So Jigsaw, data.com, really cool. Another thing that I like about Jigsaw is because it collects business cards, it can go in and you can find out recent title changes at the company. So Jigsaw had a business card, somebody uploaded a new business card, and they'll give you the dates of those different changes and what's called the most purchased contacts. So these are people that other people are buying. So those are usually the decision makers. Now, uh, in doing research on distribution companies and manufacturing companies to prepare for presentations, one of the things that always comes up is, hey, Sam, one of the things I need to find out from an information perspective is the risk, the credit risk of companies that I do business with. Because I've got lots of suppliers. Boy, if some of them go out of business, I'm in big trouble. Or with some of my clients, I'm actually uh, allowing them to have terms. They don't have to pay on delivery. I give them terms. And boy, if those people get into financial trouble, I mean, I, I, you know, it's going to hurt my company. So um, I am. I, I actually am partner in a lot of companies. One of them is ArgosRisk.com. Argos Risk is probably one of the world's number one, but it, it, not probably, it is the world's number one source for what we call business and financial health records. So you can log in if you've got an Argos Risk account, and it is a pay-for service. You can log in and you can find out the financial risk, what's going on at all the companies with where you have a financial interest. Uh, like I said, suppliers, uh, customers, those kinds of things. And it's a super easy thing. We look at things like credit reports, D&B reports, plus about 250 other sources of data, court records, how many executives have resumes out, customer reviews. And you can log in on a daily basis. The stuff changes every day. And you can see, hey, hopefully all of your people are in the green. If they're in the yellow, something happened at their company, maybe a C-level executive has a resume out. Oops, they're in the red. Something happened with their credit. And what this allows you to do, you say you don't have to know credit scores like 827, whatever that stuff means. You just log in every day, oop, red, yellow, green. You can click and find out. And frankly, you can even set it up so anytime anybody, any of your customers go into red or even yellow, you get an email. And then you can click and find out what's going on. Okay, that's pretty cool. What I wanted to do is allow all of you to experience what a credit report looks like. So you can all go get three free credit reports. You can log in right now to go to argosfree.com, type in your email address, and then that will forward you to a page where you can enter the names of up to three companies and we'll send you a free credit report on those companies. So if you've got a supplier relationship, if you've got a customer, if you've got a prospect that you're going to be calling tomorrow and you want to get some sales intelligence on that prospect and you want to know, hey, are these folks going to be able to pay their bills on time, go to argosfree.com. Type in uh, your email address. That will forward you to a place where you can enter in 
the company information you're interested in, and we'll send you those three free credit reports. So I hope you take advantage of it. I know you'll love it. I just wanted to give that to you. Again, it's not a it's, it's a free tool. The Argos Risk is a subscription database, very, very affordable. I think it's like 99 bucks a month to get access to all the financial um, and business health of companies you're doing business with. But you can go get those three free reports right now. Now, another source that I like for folks in the manufacturing world and the distribution world is thomasnet.com. You're probably all familiar with the old Thomas Registry. Well, Thomas Registry is that, that, you know, the war and peace book, if you will, of all the manufacturers. Uh, in the world. Well, Thomas Net, they put that online. It's a free service. You can go in. You can type in the types of plastics you're looking for, the types of supplier you're looking for. You can type in the geographic region. It will give you information about the company. You can click and get detailed information about the company. So it's a great sourcing tool. Now, earlier I showed you um, Google News. And Google News is awesome when you're searching on larger companies like Caterpillar. But most of us are calling on smaller companies. And unfortunately, those smaller companies, if they're going to be featured in the news, they're going to be featured in their local hometown news. And unfortunately, a lot of times Google does not get to those smaller newspapers. And so um, one of the things that, that you can do is, so for example, here's an example. I'm going to go in. I'm meeting with DGI Supply. It's a small manufacturer. I'm going to Google, type in DGI Supply, use my quotes, click on more, click on news. Nothing shows up. So what you can do is there's this website called YouGotTheNews.com. You Got the News searches literally more than 5,000 national, but also business news and local news. So it'll get to the local business journal. It'll get to the local, uh, your local newspaper, your local shopper. So watch. Google News had nothing on DGI Supply, but I go to YouGotTheNews.com, run the exact same search, and what do we find out? We find out that the CEO of DGI Supply, the guy that I'm meeting with, was actually the gold medalist on the 1956 U.S. Olympic swim team. So I can click on this article, I can read the article, and when I go in and meet with John, what, am I, what do you think I'm going to talk about? I'm going to talk about something I know he's passionate about. Hey, John, before I meet with people, I like to do a bit of homework. And, uh, and hey, guess what I found? I saw that article where you were uh, the 1956 gold medalist. Hey, I've never met a gold medalist before. Can you tell me about that? That is so cool. Again, I, I, now I want to um, share with you something I just said because it's really important because a lot of people will say to me, okay, Richter, this is really spooky. I don't want people to think I'm a spy. So if I go in and meet with people, I don't want to freak them out. What do I do? And notice the language that I use before I go and meet with John. Let me break that down. John, before I meet with people, I'd like to do a bit of homework. I want to make sure everything we talk about is relevant to what I think you might care about. What do I do when I say that language? I'm showing John that I care. And by the way, I'm differentiating myself from all the other people he's ever met with. Now, this next part's also really important. It's, and guess what I found? John, before I meet with people, I do a bit of homework. I want to make sure everything we talk about is relevant to what you care about. And guess what I found? Why is that important? Because when John saw my name on his calendar this morning, what was going through his head? God, why do I need to meet with this guy? And when I meet with him, if I automatically start about, out about me and my company, I open up my brochure, you know what's going through his head? When is this guy going to go home? But the second I say, hey, John, before I meet with people, I like to do a bit of homework, and guess what I found? Guess what happens when I say, and guess what I found? He thinks to himself, oh, my goodness, what did he find? And I completely have his attention. Hey, I saw that article where you were the 56 gold medalist. That, then you're in, able to engage with somebody. You're able to talk about something you know that they're passionate about. LinkedIn, one of my favorite invisible websites. What is LinkedIn? LinkedIn is like six degrees of separation, but it's really three degrees of separation. Who do you know that knows somebody that knows somebody? About 270 million business executives on LinkedIn today. It's estimated that a new person is adding a profile every second of every day. LinkedIn is an amazing sales intelligence tool. How do you use it? Well, you type in someone's name. Most of you are going to go just type in someone's name, and it's not going to work so well. I use my Boolean. I type in someone's name within quotes, and then I put in the first word, or one word, I just put in any word of their company name, and I can go right to it. So here's our friend Jane, our new uh, 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 president of the association, director of the association. And she's also obviously president of COPE. But I can go in, if I'm meeting with Jane, I can get some great sales intelligence five minutes before the meeting. What's her work experience? What's her educational experience? What are some of the things she likes to do? Now, if I'm gonna, am I going to go in and like talk about, hey, you know, how soccer? No, I'm not going to do that. 
But I might say, and it's perfectly cool to say, especially in today's world, hey, Jane, before I meet with people, I like to do a little bit of homework. And, um, you know, we're both on that LinkedIn thing together, and so I, I bothered to look at your profile, and I see that you used to play uh, women's soccer at Eastern Illinois. That's so cool. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Again, get the other person talking about something you know they're passionate about. That's how you can use tools. In I can even go in and see some of the honors she's won, and even some of the other activities that she cares about, the associations that she belongs to, the nonprofit organizations that she cares about. Again, all it paints a picture of this person before I even walk in the room. I can go learn about her family, her interests, her outside interests. She plays soccer. She likes uh, piano, gymnastics, and she's involved with her church. Again, all this information paints a picture of who this person is, again, before I even walk in the room. Now, sometimes you're going to have information on somebody else you choose not to use it because maybe it's just not appropriate. But when you have information like this on another person, even if you choose not to use it, how does it make you feel? Well, it makes you feel powerful and confident. Now, right about this time in the presentation, people are getting a little freaked out. They're like, okay, Richter, you're really scaring with me on what you can find on other people. What are bad guys finding? And unfortunately, the answer is way too much. I'm not going to tell you how I did this search because I'd probably get arrested if I did, but I can tell you the result of it, and it's not hard. Here's a list of 52,000 names, and you can read the heading across the Excel spreadsheet. First name, last name, address, city, state, zip, phone, email, employer, card type, credit card holder, and even the three-digit CSC file. So I'm not going to tell you how I find this stuff, but I can tell you it's out there, and bad guys are trading on this information. Now, who's the most protected woman on the planet? I think we would all say probably Michelle Obama. Does it freak you out that it takes me less than three minutes to find her TransUnion credit report? Yes, this is the real Michelle Obama, formerly Michelle Robinson, and this is her real TransUnion credit report. This is her real Social Security number that I went in and uh, pixelated it out. Um, and the reason I pixelated it out is I prefer to uh, I prefer to stay out of jail today. But yes, this is the type of stuff you can find um, online. And like I said, bad guys are trading on it. Here's her Bank of America credit report. Here's her uh, student loan information. She has paid off her student loan. She was paying $32 a month. So it does freak me out that I can even go find this stuff. So what can you do about it? Well. It's not only your personal identity that's at risk, it's your business identity that's at risk. And as a matter of fact, it's probably a bigger issue today. Business identity theft is an $800 billion issue. Uh, there's a, I could do a two-hour webinar just on business identity theft and fraud. What I've done is I've created a little ebook for you. It's completely free where you can go download this ebook, and it will give you the steps that you need to take to protect yourself and your company from having your information stolen. Now, unfortunately, there's no way to 100% protect yourself, but you can certainly minimize the risk. So go to btheft.com, type in your uh, email address, and I'll instantly send you that guidebook, uh, what is business identity theft, how it impacts every single company that's out there, and what are some simple steps that you can do to protect yourself and your company from being the next victim. Okay, back to sales intelligence. So I've shown you how to use Google. I've shown you how to use the invisible web. But you don't have access to the best stuff. The best stuff, in fact, is locked up in super expensive databases. Uh, these databases are available to big companies with big dollars. You've heard the names of those databases, Dun & Bradstreet, Hoover's, Value Line, Morningstar. Well, that's not very fair. Why does the big companies like Caterpillar, 3M, Fortune 500 companies, why do they get access to super expensive databases and the rest of us get what we can find on Google and the invisible web? Hopefully way better than you were able to now, but still don't have access to, this, to the same information as the big companies, except for in one place. Did all of you know that all of you have access to about, oh, I don't know, $3 million worth of high-end subscription databases, completely free? Where? At your public library. Public libraries subscribe to the same big databases the big companies subscribe to, list building databases like Hoover's, Dun & Bradstreet, Info USA or Reference USA, which is also, you may have heard the radio ads for Sales Genie, all the same types of databases, news databases, magazine databases, trade journal databases, all available for free at your public library. And here's the beautiful thing. You only have to go to your public library one time because when you're there, they're going to give you this piece of plastic. It's called a library card. 
On the back is going to be a number. Go find your public library website. Now, every public library in the world has a different website, but they all have a button on there called something like databases or online resources. So here's my public library website in Hennepin County, Minnesota. I can click on here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in my pajamas, and I can access the same super expensive databases the big, pay, big companies are paying big dollars for. I can access those same databases free of charge because I have that library card. All I need to do is log in. Again, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I can type in my library card number, and now I'm accessing the same super expensive databases the big companies have access to. I'm accessing them for free because I have that library card. So congratulations, you're all graduates of 4th R University. And you know what I have to say to that? Who cares? How do we actually use this information to grow our business? So let me give you a couple of examples. We're going to go hunting for business. Now, most of us, if you were in sales and business development, BG, remember those first days 16 years ago, you'd go to your boss, hey, boss, where do I get my leads? And what did they hand you? They handed you the phone book, right? Uh, where do I start? Oh, on A. How do I know when I'm done? Z. That's called hunting for little rabbits. Let's call every single person in the phone book, and uh, you know, if we make enough calls, somebody will buy from us. And many of you maybe even still do that today. Well, if we call everybody on our list, somebody will eventually buy from us. Well, I don't like to hunt for little rabbits. I want to go fat rabbit hunting. I only want to find the right people who are qualified to purchase from us. So how do you find these folks? Will you use the fourth R? Let me show you what I mean. We're going to log into Google. Hey, Google. Find me an Excel spreadsheet. Somewhere in that Excel spreadsheet has to be the word president or the word CEO, the word Tennessee or the word TEN, file type colon XLS. So limit my search results to spreadsheets. There are 39,100 spreadsheets with those answers in there or those, that information in there. I open one up. Here's a list of every major decision maker in the state of Tennessee, full contact information including website, address, email address direct phone number, everything. This is the kind of stuff you can find online. Uh, find me purchasing manager. So Google, find me an Excel spreadsheet. Somewhere inside the spreadsheet is the word manager, is the word hospital, is the word purchasing. So those are words that are sitting inside the spreadsheet. 10,800 results appear. I click on the first one. Now again, a lot of these searching for file types and things like that, it's kind of an art form. You just kind of trial and error. Try different things, see what shows up. I click on the first one, and it's a list of every major purchasing and procurement manager at every major and minor healthcare company in the entire United States. Full contact information, including email address, direct line, fax number, everything you need to contact these fat rabbits. LinkedIn Advanced, one of my favorite fat rabbit hunting tools. Because again, there's 270 million people within LinkedIn. How do you find them? You click on the Advanced tool. Now notice what I'm doing. I'm using my Boolean with the Invisible Web LinkedIn. Hey, LinkedIn, find me every purchasing or procurement person. Their job title is either director or manager or VP, that's their current title, in the medical device industry located within 50 miles of my house. Now seriously, how many procurement managers in the medical device industry do you think I know who are living within 50 miles of my house? Well, pre-LinkedIn, that number would be zero. But by running the search in LinkedIn, I can find that there are 406 fat rabbits that perfectly fit my profile. Now you're sitting there going, okay, that's all well and good, Richter, but um, maybe you've got lots of connections, and I do. Maybe you've got 10 connections, and every time you run this kind of search, you get a job title. And what happens when you click on the job title? Well, LinkedIn wants you to buy the name. I told you the stuff I'm sharing with you today is free. So how do we get around it? Watch this. Anytime you get a job title in LinkedIn where it's not allowing you to click on the name, just highlight the job title, right mouse click, and do copy. So anytime you get a job title, highlight the job title, right mouse click and do copy. Then go into Google and do paste. And paste that job title in exactly as it was within LinkedIn. Punctuation, grammar, even if there's misspellings, magic trick, put the job title within quotation marks and Google will give you the person's name. So you can use LinkedIn to do your fat rabbit hunting. And even if you have no connection with the person, if all you get is a job title, highlight the job title, right mouse click, copy into Google, paste paste within quotation marks, nine times out of ten, Google will give you that person's name. I can even log into my public library at three in the morning. 
I can log in and use one of their list building databases. At Hennepin County Library, I'm going to choose Reference USA. And I can say, hey, library, at 3 in the morning, because I've got a library card, I want you to build me a list of all the manufacturers. Um, well, not all the manufacturers in Minnesota. I just want you to build me a list of, of companies that are maybe in the commercial design manufacturing world, because they probably use some plastics. Well, not everybody. I just want to call on small companies. And at 3 in the morning, in my pajamas, I can build a list. The same list that big companies are paying big dollars for, I can pay, or I don't have to pay anything. I get it free of charge because I have a library card. And I can even download that list and upload that right into my contact management software. So I can use Google, I can use the invisible web, I can use the public library, I can use LinkedIn to go fat rabbit hunting and build the exact type of people, a list of the exact type of people that I want to call on. Now, who cares? What do I actually do with this list? So let's take out my list, and we're going to research one of those companies. So we're going to pretend we have a meeting with Environmental Graphics, a small, privately held company located in Hopkins, Minnesota. So first, of course, we're going to go into Google. We type in Environmental Graphics. We use our quotation marks, Environmental Graphics plus Minnesota, because we do a nice Boolean search. We get their website. It's the first link we click on. So we click on their website address, and we learn a little bit about the company. It's a company that crafts murals. They create wall murals, beautiful wall murals, 15,000 designs, and they sell their murals to commercial designers, hotels, restaurants, those kinds of things. They also have a separate company called Murals Your Way that sells direct to consumer. So these murals, you can go online as a consumer, and you can actually you know, uh, buy one of these murals for your house, and they ship it right to you. So it's really two companies, Murals Your Way and Environmental Graphics. Now that's where most of us are going to stop. Hey, we just got started. We're going to log into an invisible website called Manta.com. Manta is kind of just like Jigsaw. So I can log into Manta.com, and I set up my free, I register for my free account. Once I register for my free account, I can go in, I can type in the name of a company, and I can learn a little bit about the company. So they do between 5 and 10 million, have about 25 employees, and the key executives at the company are Ted Yock, he's the CEO and owner, Paul Joyce, the finance executive, and Todd M. Holt, in charge of sales. I write that information down. Now I log back into my public library at 3 in the morning. This time, instead of building a list, this time I'm going to go in and I'm going to research the company. I type in the name of the company, Environmental Graphics. I can then get information about that company. I learned that they actually have 30 employees. They do about $6.2 million in revenue. They were formed in 1973, and they're an A-plus credit rated company. Well, great. Now that I have that, let's go meet with the company. So I'm going to go into Google. I type in Murals Your Way or Environmental Graphics, and I get 1.6 million results. Do I care about any of them? No. What am I going to do? I'm going to click on More, and I'm going to click on News, because I don't have time to look at 1.6 million results, but I do have time to read 10 articles. So instead of looking at 1.6 million web search results, I'm going to read 10 articles. What are some of the things that I learn? Well, they've come up with a brand new product, and they recently won Best of Show at Neocon. What's Neocon? I have no clue, so I Google it. It's the Oscars of the interior design industry. When I go meet with Ted Yock, their CEO, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about them. I'm going to talk about them winning Best of Show at Neocon. I'm going to talk about their new repositionable wall mural. Got to reach these people. How do you find them? Well, I'm going to use my something at trick. I log into Google. I know their website address is Murals Your Way. So I do something at muralsyourway.com. Remember, I put the whole search within quotation marks because I want to treat the email address like a phrase. And I pull up email addresses, Todd at Murals Your Way. If I want to reach Ted, their CEO, what's his email address? Well, most likely, it's Ted at muralsyourway.com. I'm going to go into zoominfo.com, a really cool invisible search engine. Again, I'm going to register for my free account. Now I go to zoominfo.com slash s. That's an important thing to know. Don't go to the regular Zoom Info. They just want you to buy stuff. I go to zoominfo.com slash s. I type in the name. And what do I learn? I learned that I was wrong. Ted Yock is no longer the CEO of the company. He's the past CEO of the company. Hey, just because it's online doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. So I type in one of those other names. I choose Todd M. Holt, Environmental Graphics. And we learn that Todd is the president of both Environmental Graphics and murals your way. So knowing how to search and knowing where to search helps you get that accurate information. 
Now I go into LinkedIn. Do I know any of these people? I type in Todd Imholt plus environmental. Notice my nice Boolean search, Todd Imholt within quotation marks. I put in part of the name of the company, and that delivers me right to his page. And we learn where he used to work, where he went to school, some of the things he cares about. So Todd even tells us right on his page that he's into family, entrepreneurship, developing people, golf, and travel. And he went to the University of St. Thomas. So before even meeting with this person, I start to have a, a vision of some of the things that he cares about. I go into reachable.com. Love reachable.com. What is reachable.com? You open up your free Reachable account by logging in and registering. And then you can upload all of your contacts from your Facebook account, your email account, your LinkedIn account. And then you can type in the name of a person. So here's Todd Imholt. And then what does Reachable do? It looks at all across my accounts and it says, here's me, here's Todd, here's all the people that I know that happen to know Todd. And I can click on any one of those. In this example, I'm going to choose Jason. And I can even see the connection strength. So Jason and I have a connection strength of six. That typically means you used to work together. And we did. Jason and I used to work at a company called Digital River. Jason has a connection strength of nine with Todd. Jason is Todd's marketing director. Why do I care? Because I can guarantee you if I pick up the phone and call Jason, Jason is going to give an introduction to me to Todd. Other cool sites. I can go to opensecrets.org. I can type in the name of a person or the name of a company. And it gives me every political contribution that that person or company's ever made. Why? Because sometimes knowing what not to say is as important as knowing what to say. As you can see, if I do meet with Ted, he's got a certain political persuasion. Now, Twitter. We all know about Twitter. Go find. Go get a Twitter account. I love Twitter as a sales intelligence tool because people who are on Twitter will tell you what's going on at a company. How do you find people at a company that have a Twitter account? You go to tweeps.com. Type in murals your way. And in this example, we find out that our friend Todd even has a Twitter account. I can follow Todd, and he'll tell me what's going on at his company at any given moment. Now I want to research more about this Todd. Who is this Todd person? So I go into Google. I type in Todd Imholt, and I get 26,000 results. Well, most of them have to do with murals. I don't care about murals. I want to know Todd the person. So what do I do? I use my minus sign, Todd Imholt minus murals. I run the search. And this time, I get 16,000 results. Well, I don't care. Most of them have to do with Twitter. I don't care about Twitter. I want Todd Imholt the person. What do I do? I do minus Twitter. I log back in. Sorry about that. I log back in, and I do minus Twitter. And now I'm down to 1,300 results. And most of them have to do with environmental graphics. Well, I already know about the company. I don't care about environmental graphics. What do I do? I do minus environmental. And within less than 30 seconds, using a few minus signs, I get down to the information that matters. What do I learn? Well, here's Todd's Facebook page. I can click on his photos. Here's Todd in a picture of a young man, and Todd in a picture of another young man. Uh, what, who is Todd? Todd is the father, most likely the father, of two teenage boys. Here's a Todd, picture of Todd and Woody Harrelson. Why do I care? I'm not really sure. But dude, you seriously need a wardrobe consultant. I'm not, not so sure about that shirt. I see that Todd is on the board of directors of Vision Loss Resources. In fact, he's the president of Vision Loss Resources. Why do I care? Well, it tells me a little bit about the person. If you're a president of a nonprofit board, that's a lot of work. So he's very philanthropic. He's very charitable. Uh, he probably has someone in his life that's been touched by vision loss. Todd was featured on a website called NotAllCEOsAreJerks.com. Um, why do we care? Well, notice here's Todd. Here's the two boys. And I'm guessing the woman in the middle is Mrs. Imholt. Todd told us in LinkedIn that he likes to golf. Well, let's go to ghin.com, and we'll see if he's any good. We log into ghin.com with our free account. We type in Todd Imholt, and we see that he's actually a pretty good golfer. We see every single time that he's played golf. We even see the golf club where he's a member. In fact, I know somebody who golfs at that club. Maybe my friend can make an introduction. Oh, what the heck? We've already violated his privacy. We may as well finish. So we'll go to 411.com. We type in Todd Imholt, and we see that Todd and his lovely wife, Shelly, live at 115 Ridge Drive West. Well, once I have that, I can log into Zillow.com. I can paste in his address, 115 Ridge Drive West. I can learn everything there is to know about his house. I can get pictures of his house. I can learn all sorts of things. Well, I can even see if he's current on his taxes. Well, now that I have that, I'm going to go to GoogleEarth.com. Again, I'm going to log in. I'm going to type in his address, and I'm going to actually pull right up his driveway. I'm seeing if he's cooking pancakes this morning. 
Well, now that I have that, I better go spy on his neighbors. So I'm going to go to neighbors.whitepages.com. I'm going to type in the address, and I'm going to pull up the name, phone number, and information about all of his neighbors. Well, now that I have that, I want to make sure that he's not some nutball. So I'm going to go to criminalsearches.com. I type in his name. And, well, thank goodness Todd doesn't show up, but a lot of his relatives do. Now, there's nothing on here related to drugs and alcohol or business, but a lot of O's. What's O? O's a traffic ticket. So a lot of Todd's relatives like to speed. And, by the way, if any of you have ever gone through a red light, congratulations. You, too, are part of criminalsearches.com. Now, am I showing you those stuff? I don't know. I mean, do you really need to know about neighbors? White pages, do you really need to know about Zillow? Do you need to really need to know about Google Earth and criminalsearches.com and Cal Golf Handicap Network? Probably not. But my personal mantra in life is give the person a fish, feed them for a day, teach them to use the Internet, and they leave you alone for a super long time. So none of you are getting any work done today. You're all going to be logging into Zillow and criminal searches and those kinds of things. Okay, do you really need to do that if you're going to go meet with Todd today? Do you really need to go to all those different places? Of course not. But is it reasonable that before you meet with the company, you could go in and look at Todd's LinkedIn profile? You could pull up a Google News search. If nothing shows up in Google, you could do a You Got the News search. Of course you can. That's reasonable. I call it the 3 by 5 Spend three minutes trying to find five pieces of information. Spend five minutes trying to find three pieces of information. It's easy to do now that you have the tools and the knowledge to find the information you need to be successful. Let me leave you with some gifts. If you need to reach me, if you've got any questions, I know I'm going a little bit long here. I apologize for that. You can answer some questions here or just find me on Google. I'm really easy to find. Send me an email.